But I think the things that I other talk to you about are the things that you've learned over doing this for 20 years about what works, what doesn't work, what's sort of the things that you used to lean on that you now find maybe aren't all there or cracked up to be. And what yeah. are the sort of some of the newer things that, that you maybe um, weren't doing back then that you maybe have, have changed and evolved and, and maybe you shifted more from just elite sports performance to more enhanced health? I would say probably the two top things that come to mind would be my approach to exercise and my approach to community. I was, was hardcore. You know, I, I raced for Team Timex and Ironman Triathlon for 10 years. I switched to Reebok and raced obstacle course racing for another four years. Before that, I was two years as a bodybuilder. I mean, literally just like lean, mean, 3% body fat and 215 pounds, just like a piece of libidoless muscle who'd hang out on the couch and go visit the gym and drink protein shakes. So I experienced the extreme, <laughs> yeah, not a head, yeah. Ironman triathlon and bodybuilding do not do those sports for help. Uh. Do them for photos and to climb your own personal Mount Everest, but mm -hmm. don't fool yourself into thinking that those are actually healthy sports. Um, you know, and I think researchers like James O'Keefe have popularized this idea that there's a so-called Goldilocks zone of exercise, right? Once you exceed, I think it's about 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise and about 70 minutes of high intensity exercise, which we could define because I think some people get scared when they hear don't exceed 70 minutes of high intensity exercise until they understand what high intensity exercise truly is. But anyways, once, once you exceed those bounds, then you start to see things like atherosclerosis, increased risk of mortality, you know, arterial stiffness, a lot of the things that you would expect if someone was in a chronic inflammatory state yeah. without adequate recovery. And, you know, if you look at, I don't know, you know, either the, the bodybuilding or the marathoning craze of the 80s or the surge of CrossFit and fitness competitions, you know, Spartan, High Rocks, it's very easy to fall into that category of someone who over-exercises. Yeah. I certainly did for a long time and, um, and experienced a lot of the issues that go along with that. You know, not to mention that I was also one of the early adopters of the whole keto low carb thing for endurance sports, which is another kind of nail on the coffin. If you don't have, it, it's not a bad approach, but if you excessively restrict carbs, you just don't have enough for, for thyroid, for testosterone, for the, you know, proteoglycans and joints, you, you can basically destroy yourself with excessive carb restriction married to excessive exercise. Yeah. So I have learned a lot since being fooled into thinking that you can basically out exercise your diet, that the more is better. And especially that like chronic repetitive motion exercise, you know, like running and cycling and swimming that I did a lot of is the healthiest way to go. Mm. Now I'm a huge fan of walking. Um, wow, that's yeah, like a big yeah. Iron Huge Man. Huge fan of walking. 100 mile yeah, races. I run occasionally. Walking. So, well, if I'm playing pickleball, I guess that counts as running. Pickleball or family tennis on Wednesday nights. Yeah. And then occasionally when I walk down to the mailbox, because we have a long driveway, I'll be like, okay, I'm going to grab the mail and run back up the driveway. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, Mark Sisson just wrote a book about this, uh, Born to Walk. You know, yeah. it's about this whole idea that human beings are more biomechanically designed for walking and it's more favorable for cardiovascular adaptations without excess damage to the body compared yeah. to running, well, which I think is, is a good idea. Chase and catch an animal, right? You do, With but for very short periods of time, yeah, not bursts. at a slow pace, you know, in, in short bursts. And I consider that to be like, like a healthy form of running, but yeah, 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. First of all, that definition would be not necessarily what people might think of as like going for a walk or gardening or cleaning the garage or even tooling around your house with a 10 pound weighted vest on, if that's your thing. Like I consider all of that to be just primal, natural movement, movement, you know, in physiology, you know, you'd call it neat, right? Non-exercise -ex activity thermogenesis. Yeah, I did that's, a lot of that. It's called fidgeting. You used yeah, to have the people yeah, in the fidgeting, front of, my, in front of you know, me. Your, what do they my call them? School, the, that's crazy. <laughs> the fancy name for these. What, there, was a, there was actually a study that came out on glycemic variability and doing this, they called them a soleus push-ups, uh -huh. which is basically what you and I probably call a seated calf raise. But, yeah. you know, those type of little things, none of that falls into the category of the 150 minutes of moderate exercise 
realize that if you exceed would be bad for you. We're talking about like the frowny face, like jaunt on the treadmill for mm-hmm. 45 minutes mm-hmm. a day or the mm-hmm. triathlete or marathon or swimmer or cyclist who's getting like, you know, one and a half to two hours of moderate intensity aerobic exercise. Definitionally, if you wanted to get into the physiology of it, you know, you've got your aerobic threshold. You technically have, you have two different thresholds that you cross during exercise, VT1 and VT2. VT1 is ventilatory threshold one. That's when it starts to get hard to carry on a conversation. And that's when you've reached what's called aerobic threshold. That's what a lot of people now call zone two. Mm. I think, for example, probably Dr. Peter Atia has, has popularized the most this notion of zone two exercise. That's right. Yeah. Zone two exercise, that'd be kind of like the zone you get into when you get to VT1. And then you exercise and exercise and you're gradually burning more and more carbs and less and less fat and lactic acid is starting to build up and you're beginning to be hungry for oxygen and you eventually reach VT2 which is when lactic acid starts to accumulate more quickly than it can be removed. Some people will also call that like the anaerobic threshold. So that 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise that if you exceed is no longer that great for you is that whole stretch between VT1 and VT2, right? And so again, most people who are just moving around during the day, they're still below VT1, yeah. right? Like I can, I walk on my treadmill sometimes when I'm doing a podcast, right? Yeah. And that all counts as just, You know, nothing close to the type of exercise that'll be bad for you. And then the 70 minutes that if you exceed that per week is also bad for you. On top of the 150. Right, exactly. It's not the the combinatorial effect of the two of them. It's like don't exceed 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, or at least try not to exceed it too much. And then also don't exceed 70 minutes of vigorous intensity exercise within that 150 minutes or in addition, like 220 minutes or? They would be, I, so, so let's say you are. Give you an example. Let's say you're an endurance athlete and you're barely doing any vigorous intensity exercise, but you're logging like 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise throughout the week. You would be past the Goldilocks zone, regardless of whether or not you've done the high intensity stuff. And similarly, if you're a CrossFitter who's logging like a hundred minutes of vigorous intensity exercise per week and barely doing any of the 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, you'd also fall into that no zone with that. That would be risky to get into the 70 minutes, that high intensity exercise, that would be all the stuff that's past VT2. That would be pretty intense burn going pretty hard. Really Most people talk during that, you walk into the average gym and one person out of a hundred might really truly be in that zone, yeah. but it's still, there's still a lot of people who do and keep saying this word. I don't want to throw them under the bus, but like CrossFit six times a week, yeah. or, you know, they're training for something very intense, obstacle course racing, you know, an, an athlete who's heavy in training again, like I have no problem with people going out and doing an Ironman or, you know, training for CrossFit or anything like that. What I'm saying is that I used to think that that was heart healthy activity. Mm. And now I can see that, oh, it's, it's more something that's great for perseverance, for endurance, for character, and to, again, climb your own personal Mount Everest, but it's not healthy for you. Yeah. And I used to think that it was, and I've changed my stance on that. If you love that last video, you're gonna love the next one. Check it out here.